a great state party to new heights. Solid financials, excellent organization, a ground game that he will bring to bear this fall to bring us victory. And with that, I invite this man to join to join us on the stage, John Whitbeck, Chairman of the <laughs> Just to remind everybody, we are standing on a property owned by our president, Donald J. Trump. And you know what? Let me tell you something. It's an honor to be introduced by Scott Hamburger, the CEO of Fortessa. Scott, thank you for all you do for our party, for our, our movement, uh, for Loudoun County. Uh, what you've done to help us in the last couple of years get back on our feet, really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Um, I want to thank a couple of other people. We had a, a finance team that helped us with this event tonight. First of all, Dave Nitta, a financial analyst with uh, one of my played football against each other in college. Uh, Dave, thank you for your help. Uh, Jeff Chapman of uh, Babel Street. Jeff, where are you at? Back in the back. Thank you, Jeff, for your help tonight. Uh, Mark Serrano, uh, who is here tonight, he's a public relations executive. Uh, we're going to interrupt from the beginning. There he is. Mark Serrano. Thank you, Mark. And uh, I want to thank our finance chair, Jerry Kilgore, our former attorney general, who's here tonight. I also want to thank Delegate Glenn Davis, who's running for lieutenant governor. He is here tonight. Joining us all the way from the community. And then I'm an embarrasser, but I want to thank my wife, Laura, who's here. Thank you for coming up. All right, so I said, okay, one of my opening remarks, they got to be approved by the White House, of course. And they handed me Sean Spicer's biography. It's four pages, folks. So I'm going to get it going, and I might skip some parts, but it's not going to be any less impressive. So I've known Sean for a long time. I've known him as a member of the RNC, Republican National Committee. I had the pleasure of working alongside him in the Republican leadership. E.W. Jackson, great to see you, my friend. Thank you for <laughs> Anytime the bishop shows up, I gotta recognize him. But prior to serving in the West Wing, Sean was a communications director and chief strategist for the Republican National Committee from 2011 to 2016. Imagine being the chief strategist in 2016. Sean was a principal communicator for the RNC, making hundreds of appearances on television and radio, and disseminating the RNC's message in print interviews and social media as well, but it paled in comparison to what he's doing now. <laughs> as the chief strategist, strategist title, he, he interfaced with broadcast networks and Wait, this is way too much detail. <laughs> We're going to skip to the good stuff. He worked at the RNC Council's office and chief of staff on assisting state parties. Thank you very much, Sean. With delegate selection for the state conventions. You all know what a dilemma that was last year. He came to the RNC in February of 2011 at a time when it was deeply in debt and badly tarnished by what happened in 2008 with the election of Barack Obama, which we are now reversing the damage done. Under his administration. After 2012, Sean brought a lot of changes to the communication of the Republican National Committee. He expanded its engagement in minority media outlets and diverse communities. He reinstituted a nationwide communications training effort known as the RNC's Communications College. His video, video production team, I can tell you from personal experience, is first rate. And they did the nice thing of taking all of them with them to the White House when uh, the president got elected. So the team that you have in your White House serving the people right now is second to none. And this is the good stuff. Check this out. He previously served as assistant United States trade representative for media and public affairs in the George W. Bush administration, logging over 440,000 miles of international travel in two and a half years. And his marriage survived. <laughs> From 2005 to 2006, Sean was the communications director for the House Republican Conference, overseeing media training for the members of Congress, Lord knows they need it, and for over 220 press secretaries, and before that he was communications director for the House Budget Committee. During the 2000 election cycle, Sean was a 
National Republican Congressional Committee's Director of Incumbent Retention, overseeing the re-election strategies of 220 members of Congress, and publishing the first ever incumbent survival guide. Despite Sean's work for Republicans, he's known to partner with his Democrat. What? <laughs> <laughs> he's known to partner with his Democrat counterparts to raise money for good causes because he's a good man. In 2012, he shaved his head on ABC's This Week after raising $16,000 for the St. Baldrick's Foundation with the DNC's communications director. Please, nobody put that on Twitter that I just insulted that. I'm not sure. They also worked together to raise $33,000 for military public affairs officers in an event they dubbed Flax for Flax, who wear flak jackets. Say that five times fast. Thank you. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, it is my great honor to introduce a member of the United States Navy, a man who is probably the second most famous man in the world right now. <laughs> a man who we knew in the Republican Party as an activist out in Northern Virginia back, and he is the exact same guy. In fact, I saw him just a minute ago taking photos of the view behind you because he is still inspired by the things that we love as members of this movement, this conservative movement. I watch him every day when he gives his press briefing, and I am inspired by the courage, and I'm inspired by the articulate nature of what he says, and the fact that he stands up there and fights for the conservative movement every single day, and is loyal to our president and our party. Ladies and gentlemen, Sean Spicer. <laughs> Sometimes the media talks about how uh, that's a bad thing, and they'll say, oh, he's promoting this and promoting that. But you've been here now. You see the kind of quality people, Michael and the staff that are here. They're at every Trump property. I've had an opportunity to see them around the country, and this isn't a promotion, but that's why the people, one of the things that the media gets wrong every time is they don't understand that the people who surround this president in business are the kind of people that he's surrounded himself with now, quality people care about putting out a quality product, they care about people, they care about service. So whether or not you're at a Trump property or you're around the country, it's what he inspires. People who want to do a good job for the people that they serve, whether it's in public service or business. And I think that's important to understand because this president was a successful individual who had done very, very well and was blessed and honored what he had been able to succeed in this country and knew that he could continue to be successful out in the private sector, but chose to come and serve his country. Uh, and I think that that's, that's one uh, issue that I think has gotten largely overlooked and, and I'm proud to help represent. Uh, I wanna thank all of you for being here tonight. Uh, I wanna thank John and Laura uh, for everything that he does. Uh, you know, you talk about sacrifice and I had the opportunity to meet a lot of the district chairs that have been part of this and the volunteers. And I think we, we sometimes overlook the sacrifice they make. Um, and I know Laura knows very, very clearly the sacrifice that John makes, uh, whether or not he's able to be at home or some of the financial sacrifices that he makes for his family. And that you do as volunteers and district chairs, that you come out and you help the party because you want a better country. Uh, and so you may give up time with your family or your friends or a business deal that you could have had. But that's what we're about. I think one of the things that drags us out on a night like tonight is we understand that elections have consequences and people who want to serve need resources. And that we, through our power, can help those people, whether it's knocking on doors or generating additional support. Um, tonight, I think we're just past 118 days in office. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. 
could have, you, there's no way I would have guessed the other names. <laughs> I think the, the president has squeezed every second out of every minute, out of every hour, out of every day, in those 118 uh, days plus that we spent in office. And I think when we stop and take a look at what he's been able to accomplish, it's been incredible. Uh, and it's because of all of you. And I don't say that lightly. Let me kind of tick through what we've been able to do because it's all about the people, and that's the end of the day, what we've been able to accomplish at the White House, what Congress has been able to accomplish. Uh, and I, before I start, I, just, I, I think we've got, we've got to be clear as to what 2017 means for the, for the RPV. Um, it's, it's the most ambitious year that I can recall, um, and it's been 20 plus, 20, around 20 years since I've been involved in Virginia politics. Um, under John's leadership, we've got the RPV engaged in all 134 local, county, and city district committees and rolled out a number of programs, services, and products to make sure that the Virginia Republican Party is organized and bring our nominees across the line in November. There is a lot at stake, as you know, especially if you've been watching the TV here in Northern Virginia. Um, our control of redistricting from the State House and the State Senate and congressional lines are at risk. We know how close some of those majorities are what an impact that they have. Ralph Northam and Tom Perriello are battling it out to see who can go further to the left in the gubernatorial race. They are literally battling it out to see who can get Elizabeth Warren's endorsement and Bernie Sanders' endorsement. I can't say that I have an entire history of our understanding of the Commonwealth political background, but I can tell you that at least in modern history, but you know, I, I, I think by any stretch of the imagination, these two individuals are probably the most liberal Democrats that we've seen see the state house in the Commonwealth, which is a big, big shift in what we've seen definitely in the last couple of decades. Both are in favor of repealing rights to work laws. Both are in favor of expanding Obamacare. Even as Edna just pulled out of Virginia for 2018, and Obamacare continues to clash. They're doubling down on a failed, failed system. We need to keep working as hard as we did to get a Republican president in the White House as we are going to, to make sure we maintain the majority and put a Republican back down in Michigan. Because President Trump has shown us the last 100 plus days Republicans are in office, they get things done. It's interesting. Yeah. <laughs> done to help you, but it's what we might have done. And I think one, some of the most egregious things that were done, especially on the regulatory front, thank you, um, from the Obama administration have been rolled back. But let's take a look, because again, one of the issues that I think is important, one of the things that the president was really able to do and continues to do is make, is bring a direct voice to the White House. It doesn't need the filter of the media, but that when you stop and think about what, we, what he has been able to accomplish in the last 120 days, uh, it, it really is astonishing. Think about manufacturing. ExxonMobil announced it was investing $20 billion in a program to create 45,000 construction manufacturing jobs in the United States Gulf Coast region. Charter Communications announced their plans to add 20,000 jobs and invest $25 billion over the next four years from the White House. Excuse me, from the White House. Fiat Chrysler announced it will invest a billion dollars to modernize two SU's U.S. plants, creating 2,000 jobs. Apple just made a big endorsement, uh, announcement rather. Jobs are coming back <laughs> in all, <laughs> all, all sorts of jobs are coming back in this country. And the thing that the media will never give credit is that when you listen to the individuals who are running these companies, they talk about the president's agenda, the president's leadership, and the president's philosophy. He understands what it takes as a successful businessman to create a climate, a regulatory climate, a tax climate, that inspires businesses to invest in America, to grow in America, to hire in America, and that's what we need. true energy independence, and I saw some individuals 
in the call industry here. Um, it's amazing what a debt industry that was left for dead in the last administration can do with the right leadership. The president is committed to bringing back coal. He is committed to making us energy independent. Through just one of executive orders, the president has suspended four Obama-era executive actions that were crippling American energy and production. For years, the previous administration did everything it could to, uh, to get in the way of that production. It took this president only two months to approve the Keystone Pipeline after years of delay. Those who have worn the uniform, 
the veterans that so proudly have served this country, this president has finally put them in the place of honor that they deserve. Amen. Making sure that they are served. He is saying no to the bureaucracy, no to the status quo, yes to the veterans, yes to innovation, yes to making sure that if you are a veteran and you've served, the excuses are over, the care that you need is on its way. When it comes to religious liberty, the policy of this administration is to protect and vigorously promote religious liberty. During the last eight years, Americans of all faiths have been under attack from a federal government that's targeted individuals and institutions for following the tenets of their faith. President Trump recently signed an executive order to help reverse that trend, directing the IRS to use maximum discretion when enforcing the Johnson Amendment and providing regulatory relief for religious objectors to Obamacare's burdensome mandates. We're gonna get the federal government out of the way of your ability to pr pr practice your faith. on some of the fundamental aspects of the American way of life, you're seeing this president and the entire Trump administration follow through on the promises that he's made. Just look at the bill that will fund the government through September, which the president skillfully helped move through Congress so that the media isn't giving him the proper credit he deserves. The bill includes $21 billion in funding for the military, a first step towards rebuilding the readiness around the world. And for those of you, and I know John Fredericks from the Chesapeake area, <laughs> is. But if you're from the Hampton Roads area down in Chesapeake, Tidewater, that's going to make a real difference, not just for our national security, but for our economy. It's not a convenient tr truth. The budget should have been, the 2017 budget should have been done under Obama's watch, but it wasn't. We have five months left of what was called a continuing resolution. The president got a bite of that apple that normally most presidents would have to start in 2018. And he used it to make sure that his priorities, military, homeland security, were taken care of, and he was successful. The bill includes, also includes a three-year extension to the DC School Choice Program, helping to deliver on the president's commitment to expand school choice in the District of Columbia. <laughs> so we those individuals come in and, and share their appreciation with the president personally. It's really interesting because if you hear the stories about school choice, it usually is not what the media portrays. Of course, they don't want to cover it. But I got to meet and say hi to some of these youngsters when they came in at the president's. When they have those lotteries around DC, they line up all around families just hoping for a better choice for their kid because their education shouldn't be dictated by the zip code that they live in. And through the president's actions and leadership, those children are going to continue to have a better education and a better future because he had the leadership to stand up and fight for it. One of the accomplishments that's gonna last generations and impact so many of us and our children is making Neil Gorsuch the latest Supreme Court justice. <laughs> didn't elect a Republican president, we would not have Neil Gorsuch. He tipped this court back in favor of liberty and liberty government, which is something we can all be thankful for now and in the future. During the campaign laid out a list of 21 individuals who said, if I'm elected president, I will work with these, these heritage and make sure, the Federalist Society, to make sure we put together a list of individuals that I will appoint that are committed to upholding the Constitution. And he kept his word and appointed someone that we can all be proud of going forward. Woo. He did more to stop the government from interfering in the lives of our citizens in the first hundred days, probably than any, any president in history. He's also passed more legislation in, in the first hundred days since Truman, and Truman 
certainly did not have to put up with Chuck Schumer and Nancy Great again. 